From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Father Taggart. I'm calling you from Ossining. I'm one of the chaplains here at Sing Sing. Oh, yes, sir. What can I do for you, Father? Well, nothing for me, Mr. Dollar, but possibly for someone else. Michael Cairn, one of our inmates, asked me to contact you. Michael Cairn? Mm Mm-hmm. You remember him? He wasn't sure you would. Old-time grifter and con man who got tied up with an insurance fraud a few years ago, blonde fella? Yes. Well, Michael wants to see you, Mr. Dollar. Could you possibly find the time to come up here? Oh, I don't know, Father. Is this something important? It is to Michael. Oh, well, uh, look, I'll be in New York sometime next month. Maybe I'll get a chance to stop off. Well, couldn't you possibly make it sooner? What's the rush? He's going to be there quite a while, isn't he? Not very long, I'm afraid. Michael is dying. All right, Father, you can expect me. Welcome to Johnny Dollar. Beginning tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Casualty and Insurance Company Limited, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Ed Barth, Controller's Office. This is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McCormick matter. Though you didn't authorize the investigation, Ed, I'm sure that once the facts are out, you will honor the following. Expense account, item one, $7.95. Train fare and incidentals, Hartford to Arsening, New York. I was admitted inside the prison and greeted by Father Taggart. He's a tall, mild-looking man, a Jesuit, I believe. He had a pass all ready for me, and he led me straight to the prison infirmary. Just in here. Michael will certainly appreciate your coming, Mr. Dollar. I hope it satisfies whatever's on his mind. I can't imagine what it would be. You know it was my investigation and testimony that put him in here, Father. He told me all about that. I'm sure it has nothing to do with why he wants to see you. See, his lungs started to go about two years ago, and there's just been no way to arrest the condition. Does he know how close he is? Oh, yes. And he's not afraid to die. Here we are, Mr. Dollar. Oh. What? Hardly the same man I remember, Father. He's had it bad lately. Lost a great deal of weight. Yeah. Asleep? Yes. Michael. Michael! Oh. Hey, Father. I brought someone to see you. What do you say? Hiya, Mike. Oh. (laughs) Thanks for coming. Thanks, Johnny. Thank Father Taggart here. Uh, He's an all right guy, Johnny. It's just like you. I always said you were the best insurance cop. (coughs) Here, here, what's all this? I'm kicking out, Johnny. Didn't you tell him, Father? He told me, Mike. (laughs) I guess I didn't live right. I'll be back in a little while. Thanks, Father. You take it easy, Mike. Mm. (laughs) A lousy place to die, prison. But I ain't got my choice, thanks to you. Well, it's just that you picked to do a couple of things that the law and some insurance companies didn't agree with, Mike. Uh, I don't hold none of that against you. The guy does what he does. I I don't know how to tell you this. (coughs) Maybe I better get the doctor. You shouldn't be talking so much. No, no, wait. Johnny, look, you know I'm no crybaby. When the doctor gave me the news, I got to thinking. I ain't scared to blow out, you understand? I know, Mike, I know. Uh, It's just that... I had a wife once, a long time ago when I started out. Oh? Yeah. Then I just kind of drifted out of her picture one day. And... <coughs> Ain't got a cough drop, baby. <laughs> yeah, I guess it wouldn't cure what I got. Anyhow, I, I got to do something for her before I... Well, Johnny, I lay here and I get myself an idea. Yeah, Mike? Johnny, if there was some real easy money lying around, would you pick it up for me? Depends on how clean it is, Mike, and where it's lying. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It, it, well, it's clean, all right. You can find that out for yourself. All right. Now, now listen. Till they moved me down here in the infirmary, I roomed upstairs with Joe Joe Panny. You know him? No, don't believe I do. Yeah, car thief from the Hay States. He got his sabbatical three weeks ago. Paroled. Uh-huh. Well, I've been in the camp with a lot of guys, but Joe Joe Panny <laughs> takes the cake. He's got a little old five-year trick to put in. <laughs> this Jojo, he does it like a vacation. 
You know, a real picnic. <laughs> Every time he gets a chance out in the yard, he's taking sun. So he don't get the color, see? Yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> when they push him in with me, I notice this. And I get to going over it in my head. Yeah. Why does a guy whistle in a cell block, Johnny? Why, why is he treating it like a rest home? Short term. He's got something outside waiting. <laughs> That's it, baby. He's got something waiting for him outside. Something that he knows will keep safe. Money. Thought you said this was legitimate, Mike. It is, it is. Now, wait. I didn't ask Jojo anything about this. No, I figured it out myself. Then a couple of times I hear him yelling in his sleep. McCormick, he yells. McCormick. Eh? Makes sense now, Johnny? Not yet. Ah. The big heist, Johnny, the big heist. A few years ago, a rich guy named McCormick out on Long Island or someplace like that gets turned over for $100,000 worth of jewelry. You remember? Vaguely. Yeah, well, I'm thinking that Jojo Panny was in on it somewhere. Mm. Else why would he be singing and whistling and chilling himself around this fly trap for five years? Else why would he be talking about that when he's sleeping? McCormick, McCormick. Yeah. Maybe you've got something, Mike. Ah, I know I got something, Johnny. And you got something, too. It... <laughs> oh, no, Mike. Take it easy. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. Don't you see? The insurance company must have a reward out. They always do. A reward. Yeah, but Mike, look... I tell you, Joe Joe is the ginzo that done the job. Or he knows who did it. So you look into it. Work on it. Maybe turn up the stuff and get the reward. Good clean coin. Yeah. Yeah. Send half of it to my old lady, will you? You keep the rest yourself. What'd you say? Huh? Will you? <laughs> Ego patentati mihi ad apostolia, sedi tributa indulgentiam plenarium... Mike Kern died three hours later. The last living thing he did was wink at me. Expense account item two, $14.20. Train fare and incidentals, Ossining to New York. I arrived at 2.15, dropped my bag off at the New Western, and went over to the Metropolitan Police Station to find out what I could about the McCormick matter. It was all pretty much as old Mike had told me. A Julian McCormick living on Long Island had suffered a $100,000 jewelry burglary in 1951. Twelve suspects had been arrested and released. The case was marked open and unsolved. Allied Casualty had been the insurance company involved. This is the adjustment office. Frank Porter speaking. My name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Porter. I'm an investigator. Oh, I think I've heard of you, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Wonder if you could give me a little information about a claim your company handled in 1951. A man named Julian McCormick out on Long Island. Gee, well, long time ago. Uh, what about the McCormick claim? I might have some information on it. I don't know yet. It's a long chance. I'm at police headquarters, and I notice you investigated for the insurance company. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, sure, but it's kind of late today. Tomorrow, okay? Well, you can tell me this right now. Is there any reward being offered? Gee whiz, kind of falls my sails. How's that? Well, asking about a reward. You sound like you can make full recovery and want to make sure that you'll be paid for it. Well, I said it was just a long shot. How about the reward? Well, that's pretty standard with us on cases like this. Yeah, I think it's 7500 something like that. I'm not sure. Where are you staying? New Weston. Well, I'll look it up, get the exact figure, and call you there. How'll that be? Fine, thanks. That'll be fine. Before I left the police station, I turned out a mug on Jojo Panny. He was a big, broad-shouldered lad with plenty of beef and a list of petty convictions, four of them in New York State. The last one was for carrying concealed weapons... His parole status was good, though, and the parole officer furnished me with his home address. The Allen Hotel, rates day, week, or month, 115th Street. It's open, it's open. Come on in. Hiya. Looking for Joe Penn. Yes, sir. That's me. My name's Johnny Dollar. Yeah? I, uh, I just came down from Ossining. I saw a friend of yours up there, Joe. Who was that? Mike Cairn. How's Mike? Not so good. He died today. Uh, it's too bad. He was a nice old coot. Kind of liked him. Said if I ever saw you to say hello. Uh-huh. 
He didn't give you my address. No, I got it from the parole office. You some kind of cop? No, I work for an insurance company. Oh. Buy you a drink? Sure. Why not? Expense account, item three, four dollars even for drinks. I wanted to look at Joe Joe Panny and talk to him and figure out how I was going to go about getting information from him. And the more I saw and the more he talked, the more I wondered if whatever he might have said about the McCormick case in his sleep happened to some other McCormick. After all, a man with a long list of petty thieveries is hardly ever involved in a slick, big-time safe-cracking job. That takes another kind of talent, and one I was sure that JoJo didn't have. <coughs> so I've just been taking it easy and looking around. I figure I can get a job pushing a truck or maybe a cab if I'm lucky. Got to get something to do. Parole officers kind of hard-nosed about things like that. Yeah. Drink up. Want one more? Oh, no, no thanks. Three's my limit. Like to keep in shape. Sure. Say, uh, you got anything to do? Nothing special. Why? Thought I might go out to Long Island later on tonight to say hello to an old friend of mine. If you haven't got anything to do, come on along. <laughs> You're okay, bub. Sure, why not? Uh, this friend of yours, he's an ex-con too? No, he never did any time. Just a friend. Want to say hello is all. Oh. Rich fella. His name's Julian McCormick. You're uh, very big with the hellos around here today, aren't you? Anything wrong, Joe? You probably are. Why do you say that? Nothing. Ever know anyone named McCormick? I knew a guy named Arnie McCormick once back in Salt Lake City. We were pals for a while. Oh. Yeah. Arnie was killed in the war. He'd got himself drafted in the infantry. Maybe he's related to my friend Julian McCormick out on Long Island. He wasn't related to anybody, not that bird. I'm leaving. I want to get up early tomorrow. Why not come with me? <laughs> Thanks for the drinks. He drifted off down the street and left me standing there. And one thing I was sure of, he had the name McCormick on his mind. Whether it was the right McCormick or the right case, I didn't know. Anyhow, he was my one big lead. So I was back at his hotel early the next morning and talking to the desk clerk. Penny, did you say room 210? Yeah, that's right. Vamoose. What? He left bag and baggage last night. Well, where did he go? What's his forwarding address? He didn't say. Just left. Here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Thanks. Tomorrow, there's living proof that a pretty girl can be just as dangerous as a pretty girl. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Thank you.